What? I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Episode 47, Kent under Mercia. After Whitret, Kent was again divided, this time among his sons, Athelbert, Eadbert, and Alric. Their names survive today in the penultimate chapter of Bede's ecclesiastical history. The venerable historian gives us nothing more than their names, and a great deal of subsequent history has been focused on attempting to flesh out their lives and reigns. Of the three, the best attested is Athelbert. It seems that he was the longest lived of the brothers. We know nothing about Alric, for example, except that he came to the throne in 725. Eadbert lived until 742, at which time the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us that he died, leaving behind him a son named Eadwulf, who appears to have succeeded his father as a co-ruler alongside Athelbert. That Athelbert was the senior of the three seems to be indicated by his having issued a charter in 724, about a year prior to his father's death. Whitred witnessed this document as king, but its existence may indicate that Athelbert had some authority in Kent prior to his father's death, possibly a sign that he was being groomed for the throne. As king, Athelbert issued several charters, which mainly indicate that the wheels of the state were still turning after Whitred's death. Athelbert's brother, Eadbert, was also able to use the mechanisms of power, albeit less often than his elder brother. Whereas Athelbert issued several charters, Eadbert issued only one in 727, and appeared in one other as a witness to a grant by Athelbert. Besides these fragments of royal action, the only notable points in any of these kings' reigns are their deaths, although in the case of Alric, we don't even know when that was. As I said, Eadbert died in 742, leaving a son to take his place. Eadwulf joined his uncle in promulgating and witnessing charters, but once again only a couple of these have survived, and of these, only one has a date attached. The date given is on a charter issued in 762, but the presence in its witness list of Archbishop Cuthbert, who died in 760, suggests that it was from that year at the latest. This charter, which was issued by both Athelbert and Eadwulf, is the last surviving reference to the latter, suggesting that he died not long after its creation. Athelbert also only lived for a couple more years before dying in 762. By this time, a major shift had occurred in Kent's international relations, with Athelbald of Mercia having become overlord of the southeastern kingdom. Exactly how is not recorded anywhere, meaning that we must speculate. We know, for instance, that Athelbald must have been overlord of Kent by 742, since in that year he granted a charter confirming the privileges of the church in Kent. Athelbert is present in this charter, but is presented as a supplicant to Athelbald, who requested the Mercian king help to identify and confirm the traditional privileges of the Kentish church. Whether this was truly what happened, or if Athelbald intervened in Kent so as to secure the stability of the church, as seems to be implied, we do not know. The charter makes no mention of a military intervention. It seems like an interesting coincidence, though, that Athelbald's overlordship may have begun in the same year that Eadbert died. Could these two things be connected? Maybe, but no written evidence exists which refers to a Mercian invasion. The issue is further complicated by the fact that Athelbert doesn't seem to have required Athelbald's consent when granting land, a common part of overlordship in this period. Instead, Athelbert seems to have retained all the traditional authority of a king in Kent, such as requiring his co-rulers to get his consent for any land grants. Perhaps then, Athelbald's overlordship was less concerned with personal rule than securing the economic interests of his kingdom, particularly the control of the pivotal port in London. Following Athelbald's murder in 757, Kent's relationship to Mercia is unclear. Athelbert continued to grant land as he had traditionally done until his death in 762. After this, though, the situation in Kent appears to have become increasingly unstable. (music) 
Hello listeners, thank you so much for listening to this. I just wanted to let you know that if you enjoy what I'm doing here, then it really helps me when you leave a review or a rating on the podcast provider that you're using to listen to this. When you subscribe to the show's YouTube channel, or when you become a supporter over on Patreon, where you can get access to bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and transcripts by pledging to one of the show's patron tiers. And speaking of patrons... I want to give a shout out to William DeForest and Marion Taff, who have recently become patrons. Thank you so much for your support, and I hope that you are enjoying the extra material that you now have access to. Anyway, back to the show. To reconstruct the history of Kent following the death of Athelbert, we are totally dependent on the Charter evidence. This evidence is far from ideal, since it leaves out much of the detail we would like, except for dates and who was wielding power where. After Athelbert's death, his son Eadbert became king. It seems, though, that Kent at this time was again invaded by Sussex, since we find Eadbert issuing charters alongside a mysterious king, Sigered, Given the tendency for Anglo-Saxons to give their children alliterative names, the sudden appearance of a king with the S of the South Saxon line seems suggestive, given the documented history of the two kingdoms. Eadbert vanishes from the scene fairly quickly in 762 to be replaced by Eanmund, a king whose paternity is entirely unknown. Eanmund and Sigered issued a charter together between 762 and 764. However, in 764, Offer of Mercia erupted onto the scene of Kentish politics. It is in that year that he re-grants land at Rochester, which had previously been given by Sigered, now with the consent of a king named Heobert, a man who had previously witnessed the charters of Eadbert and Sigered as a courtier. How the situation came about is sadly a mystery, but it seems clear that in 764, Offa felt the need to assert his rule over Kent in a way that had not yet been seen. Where Athelbald was content to let Kent function as a normal kingdom, Offa, in his quest for Imperium, sought to bring renegade Kentish nobles into line by deposing the native dynasty and installing a puppet who depended entirely on him. Heobert's puppet reign lasted for only about a year, though, since by 765, Offa was granting land in Canterbury without any mention of any Kentish king. This doesn't mean that there was no Kentish king, however. In that same year, Edgbert II began issuing his own charters with Offa's consent. It seems, then, that Offa, dissatisfied with his puppet Heobert, had attempted to rule Kent directly as a co-ruler, alongside a native king. This lasted only until about 774, when Offa again began issuing charters without any reference to a king in Kent. I realise that this has been a lot of names and dates and charters, so just to make sure that we don't get too confused by everything, I just want to restate what seems to have been happening. Offa possibly invaded Kent in 764 and set up a puppet ruler. This puppet lasted for only a short while before Offa began administering Kent directly, albeit as a co-ruler with Edgbert. This setup apparently did not work for Offa in the long run, who by 774 was administering Kent himself, seemingly having removed Edgbert. We can conclude then that Offa found working with the Kentish nobility to be a burden. Accordingly, he tried to subdue them in various ways before finally opting to just do away with them and assume direct control of Kent. Edgbert, though, did not meekly accept this. In 779, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that a battle was fought at Otford between the Mercians and the men of Kent. The outcome of the battle is not recorded, but we can infer that it was a Kentish victory by the sudden end after that date of Offa's direct rule in Kent and the return of Edgbert as king, attested by his again issuing charters, but now without any reference to Offa. Kent then had thrown off Mercian overlordship. Kent seems to have enjoyed this independence until Edgbert's death 
in 784. At that time, a new king took the throne, Aelmund, who issued a single charter in that year. However, seeing that his rival in the south was gone, Offa took the opportunity to ravage Kent, exile or kill Aelmund, it's not clear, and to proceed to rule again in Kent, this time as a direct ruler, from 785 up to his own death in 796. So as to secure his reign, Offa drove all potential claimants into exile, specifically Aelmund's son Edgbert, the future king of Wessex and grandfather of King Alfred, and Eadbert Prayan, a man who may have been related somehow to Edgbert II of Kent, but whose ancestry is not very clear. Securing his power, Offa then proceeded to issue charters rescinding land grants made by Edgbert after 779, and then reissuing them in his own name. The reason that Offa gave for this dramatic act was that Edgbert, who Offa refers to as his minister, had given the land away without his consent. As I mentioned on the episode on Offa, this was a striking claim, because Offa here demonstrated his conviction that Edgbert, despite defeating him in Otford, had not been a legitimate king. Although his direct rule would last for about a decade, we shouldn't think that the people of Kent just rolled over and took Offa's direct rulership of them. There was some lingering resistance, mainly in the form of Janbert, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was the son of a noble Kentish family, and who bitterly resented Offa's crushing of the kingdom's independence. Reflective of the tensions that arose between the Mercian king and the archbishop was Offa's campaign to have Lichfield established as a third archbishopric in England, ostensibly so that Tamworth would be closer to a religious capital, but also because Janbert was refusing to anoint Edgefrith as Offa's heir and successor. Upon Janbert's death in 792, Offa quickly installed a Mercian archbishop named Athelherd in his place, thus ending the last beacon of establishment opposition to the new Mercian order in Kent. And this is how things stood in Kent until Offa's death in 796. The Kentish royal line was in exile in Francia, and the kingdom was being directly ruled by the king of Mercia who was at this time undertaking his own project of empire building by not just dominating, but actively annexing the smaller kingdoms that bordered Mercia. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I've been your host, Tom Kearns, and I hope you'll join me again next time. <laughs>